Israel made its first application for patents in the 1950s. It asked for patent 47s, and the US said no. 1960s, Israel tries again, except this time it goes to Germany. It says, can we have about 100 of your M48A2s, please? Germany says, sure, and starts to ship them over. About 40 of them were delivered by the time Arab opposition grew so loud that Germany decided to stop. To make up the numbers, the US started making deliveries of M48A1s and M48A2s of its own. Total fleet grew to about 250 by the time of the 1967 war. Now, however, it was soon obvious that, much though the M48 was a reasonable tank, the 90mm gun in particular was starting to get a little bit unserviceable in terms of modern mechanized warfare. So Israel had to think about how to improve the tank, which by the way was now known as Magach, which means battering ram. So Magach 1 was the M48A1, Magach 2 was the M48A2. And they realized that it wouldn't be too hard to take the British 105 and drop it into the M48 turret, because that was basically what was happening with the original M60 tank. Similarly, because the rear hull of the M48 was pretty similar to the rear hull of the M60, it wouldn't be too hard to put the same diesel engine that the Americans were using in the M60s to replace the petrol engine in the M48. The resulting improvement was called the Megach 3, of which I am standing in front of one example at the Museum of American Armor, Long Island, New York. Now, this particular vehicle I knew back in the days when it was part of the Littlefield collection uh, from about 2003 to 2015. Before that, it was found at the Budge collection in the UK. I'm now going to, of course, take you on the familiar tour. I'm going to start at the front, go around the side, talk about the engine a little bit, not forgetting the track tension, and then we'll go in. So, let's get cracking. So we're going to start with the bow, or apparently the Israelis called it the frog because of its appearance. Uh, it's rounded, cast, developed by Chrysler about the same time as the M103, hence the initial similarity. In fact, there's a number of other similarities between the two vehicles as well. Because it is cast, it means that you can be a lot more efficient with the weight and the space. So officially, you're looking at 60 degrees slope, about four and a quarter inches of armor. But as the armor is more and more angled as you get around to the sides, it begins to thin down. So you're not having that excess or unneeded weight. Now, one of the disadvantages of having the thinner armor off on the corners is that if you get shot at from anything other than straight ahead, your armor is actually weaker. Whereas if you have a straight edge, like let's say on an M60, your weakest point is actually from direct front, and anything even slightly offset increases the effective armor thickness. So for this particular tank, keep front towards enemy. Behind the light guards, you're gonna have the horn, uh, blackout drive, service drive, and infrared headlights. So the driver will be able to drop the central periscope and install an infrared night vision, a system that basically continues on through today for a lot of American tanks. The hatch itself is an older, small hatch. Uh, it, it's actually small as a relative term. We're not talking Sherman small here. Uh, but they did decide it was a little bit too small, so most M48s you'll see will have a more triangular hatch as opposed to the rounded edge uh, that you have on this particular uh, vehicle. The mantlet, about four and a half inches thick, sloped at 30. And then, of course, you got the 105, and we'll talk about the weapons a little bit later. Down below, we have shackles mounted here. Of course, ordinarily these would be tow hooks instead uh, that you would easily be able to slip on the towing cable, rotate it, and you're good. And it also makes the ideal mounting point. So you'd have a step here. You climb on, hold on to the, uh, the headlight guards, and on into the tank you would go. So that's it for the front. And now we go around the side. Okay, starting off with the exterior features on the left side, first thing I'm going to draw attention to is the mounting of the Caliber 50. Now, of course, the M48 originally came with a little cupola for the commander for the Caliber 50 to be in. Well, the Israelis got rid of that, I'll talk about it in a second. But why waste the machine gun? So they've put a mounting for where the infrared spotlight would normally go. 
Now, officially, this was for sub-caliber training, so you didn't have to shoot 105 ammo when you're doing training exercises. You could do your gunnery with the caliber 50. Although it does seem that some went into combat with the caliber 50 mounted as a coaxial anyway, in addition to the traditional 762. As you come a little bit further back, spare track links and the rail sponson box comes here. Under the blister for the rangefinder, you're going to see one of the tactical markings. Uh, Israel, of course, had famously the large white tactical markings. Go to Google, you see what they translate as. Same with the ones on the cannon. Uh, so they will tell you battalion and company and uh, vehicle number or whatever. Up on top, you'll see a mounting point for an Uzi. Of course, this is not original to the M48 because the Americans used grease guns and they kept them inside the tank. But this is Israel. Everybody gets an Uzi. No pistols, apparently, except for the company commander. Sponsor box brings us back now to the air filters. Jerry can. Uh, they have a mounting point we they have here is for a stretcher on the rooftop. And as we come further to the back, another sponsor box, and now we have the infrared spotlight, which, as I say, would be mounted on the front. Now, realistically, you wouldn't have, you could, but it sounds, strikes me as just way too much trouble to take the spotlight, take it off in the daytime, mount it in the back and put the caliber 50 up, and then reverse the process when it gets dark. So realistically, if you thought you were ever going to fight at night, just leave it on the front and you're good. And then we come to the back. So the back of the tank, well, I'm going to start off with the little socket for the final drive fluids. Uh, then, of course, we have the large exhaust, which is at the back. It mixes both the air coming out from the cooling uh, of the engine and the oil, and also the exhaust pipes themselves. There's just two exhaust pipes, which is why the soot is kind of centered around particular locations. So model makers out there, you don't just exhaust the entire lot of it only focus around where the exhaust pipe itself is. As you come down, there are three access ports for the transmission. Down underneath, the panels are actually missing, which gives us a great view of the brake linkages. Uh, so that's how you uh, adjust the brakes. More towing hooks, the 105 millimeter travel lock or gun crutch. I'm not quite sure which term the Israelis use. And then we get to the towing pintle and a little bit of the provenance of the vehicle. So when they got this M48, they decided to try to find out if they knew what the history was behind the tank. So they email Israel and say, look, here's the tank we have. Here's the serial number. What can you tell us? And apparently the Israeli Defense Force, do, do a little bit of digging, they write back, says, yeah, we think this tank belonged to a then Lieutenant Yuval Neria. Uh, who, oh, by the way, is one of all of 40 people in the history of the Israeli Armed Forces to have been awarded the Medal of Valor, which is basically the Israeli version of the Medal of Honor in the U.S. Uh, oh, and he happens to live in New York. Come around, and uh, Mr. Neri is there looking at the tank. He's not so sure about it because he abandoned his first tank. Uh, it had sunk in bad terrain. And it, it was simply abandoned because it was sunk, not because it was damaged. Well, what we have here is an impact mark, probably from an RPG, that goes through and likely would have been a mobility kill through the transmission. So he isn't so sure, but that's what the Israeli army records say. Perhaps the vehicle was later recovered and used afterwards. But uh, if so, uh, there's a hell of a coincidence that this tank happens to be here. As we move a little bit further over, we got the various taillights. So we have a service taillight on that side. You have distance marker lights in here. Depending on how many dots you can see, that tells you whether or not you need to close or expand the distance if you're traveling at night. Uh, then you come over to the infantry telephone box. I think, I, I haven't seen it in the manual, I think this is a little light that says, hey, infantry, we would like to speak with you, please. And then you run up and open up the box and discover that there is actually no telephone mounted and they just have toilet paper. A very important thing to bring in the field. I, I, I do it myself. I'm going to go camping in the field. I do not rely on MRE toilet paper. I bring a couple of my own in Ziploc bags. And I strongly suspect I'm not the only person who does it. Let's see if my, uh, if my cameraman, who is a former artilleryman, does he nod up now? Yeah, he's nodding. You see. <laughs> 
<laughs> yep, yeah, he, he used to uh, bring his own toilet paper as well. It's the things that you, you, you have to think about when you're going away. Anyway, so that done, uh, talk about the engine in a moment. As I come up the right hand side, now you'll see that there are five return rollers per side, indicating it is an A1. However, you will not see the track tension idler that was on a lot of the early M48. So it's an interesting blend of uh, some of the very early features like the small hatch and more modern features. And you, we're also gonna see the bump stops at the front. As we move forward then, we have six pairs of road wheels per side, running on the T97 E2 track. T97 E2 is 28 inches wide, has a 6.94 inch pitch. And it'll uh, hold together by the traditional American method of end connectors with a wedge bolt. And you know, I'm afraid you can see that there's quite a bit of slack here between some of the end connectors and the track blocks. So I'm afraid that somebody at some point, especially here for example, they're gonna have to maybe loosen this up and go at it with a sledgehammer to get it back in, because obviously what will happen is if one of these uh, end connectors comes all the way off, you're about to have a bad day. As we move further forward, we're gonna see an improvement on the earlier M48A1. This double bump stop on the lead road wheel arm is actually a development of the M48A2. And it's an easy upgrade. You just take, unbolt the bump stop and replace it. Uh, the original single volute spring bump stop simply wasn't rugged enough to deal with the impacts that the wheel was receiving. But speaking of impacts of the front wheel, so we have friction snubbers and then we have the traditional American linkage to the idler wheel. So as this wheel comes up from the bump and it shortens the track length to compensate, hence compensating idler, uh, this linkage pushes forward, it stretches the idler wheel forward and it retensions the track to compensate for that shorter run. Speaking of track tension, of course, performed here, you'll notice that the shaft is hexagonal. One, two, one, two, three. Yes, hexagonal, there are six sides. And uh, you will be screwed forwards and backwards to extend the track. Note the lubrication points as well, complete with grease. All right, so once you get up onto the engine deck, uh, the first thing you'll notice is actually a very heavy engine deck and it's not much you can open uh, too easily. But the things that you need to operate routinely or access routinely, things like the oil filler or the oil level, they can actually be fairly easily accessed on the site. Now, because of the way the turret is oriented to the straight front, this is the only one I can currently open. But if you rotate the turret 90 degrees to the right, and not the left because uh, you have the IR light in the way, uh, you'll be able to easily access all these openable panels. And as you can see, they're heavy, but they do hinge up. And in this case, we have the oil filler tube port. Uh, but uh, there's not really much else that you can see of the engine. So a lot, a lot of times I like to open this up and show you the engine. Unfortunately, it's not really doable on these diesel Continentals. So best I can do maybe is just give you a photograph from the manual. So of course one of the big upgrades that the Israelis did to most of the tanks, not just the M48s, was a conversion from petrol to diesel. And in the case of the Magach 3, we now have a Continental AVDS 1790-2A. And despite the rather long name, it's actually fairly logical in its naming. So AVDS is air-cooled, V configuration, diesel, supercharged. 1790, well that's how many cubic inches you are, comes out as about 29.4 liters. And the thing cranked out about 750 horsepower. Now, uh, this is actually a drop of about 60 over the original gasoline version, but you did, as with many diesels, get an increase in range and torque. Now, because this is a whole bunch of figures and I can't remember everything off the top of my head, I am simply now going to allow a fix it in post to do exactly like his name says and give you the rest of the information. I am sitting on the infrared spotlight, made a xenon, it was a xenon uh, spotlight. 
Next to me here is the housing for the air extraction system. So basically, of course, there's lots of fumes inside the tank when you're shooting. And this is what will extract those nasty, evil fumes from inside the turret. And then, of course, we get to the loader's hatch and the rest of the turret roof. That will bring us to an end of part one. So I hope you found it interesting so far and watch out for part two in a week or two. And speaking of track tension, oh, it's here. Right. <laughs>